Hi everyone, welcome back to biology. You made it through the first week of classes, congratulations. We've covered chapter one, kind of the overview of, of biology, and now we're going to start getting into the foundational level of biology. And the foundation of biology is chemistry. So chemistry starts by telling us how we have those molecules and um, processes going on in the cell. So we're going to briefly cover them over a couple of chapters and then we'll get in, into kind of the meat of biology. So biology is the study of life. Living organisms in their environment are subject to the basic laws of physics and chemistry. So much as we may not be physics and chemistry people, we are biology majors um, or biology related majors, we have to start with kind of that foundational understanding. Um, so one example of chemistry in biology is ants can create formic acid. And um, this formic acid is related to like formica, if you've heard of formica um, countertops. Um, the format, formic acid is used by ants to protect themselves against predators and against microbial parasites. Um, matter is what the world is made of. So the stuff of everything is matter. Matter consists of chemical elements, both in their pure form and in combinations called compounds. All organisms are composed of matter. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass, and it exists in three major states. Um, my elementary school kids every year come home with homework talking about this, so I think you're probably already familiar with these three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Um, if you want to get technical, there's maybe more than just that, but this is where we're keeping it. Um, solids are tightly packed particles, and they have a constant volume and shape. So if I pick up my textbook, um, I can't just like pour it into a cup. It has that fixed shape. It, if I put it into a bag, if I put it on the floor, it's not going to spread out all across the floor. It's not gonna, you know, fill the bottom of my bag. It has that fixed volume. It is going to be shaped like a textbook. It will retain its shape and particles are not free to move around. A liquid is a more loosely packed particle and it will take the shape of its container. So if I have a carton of apple juice, the apple juice inside of it is going to be the shape of the carton. If I pour it into a bottle, it's going to take the shape of the bottle. If I pour it into a cup, it's gonna take the shape of a cup. If I pour it onto a floor, it's gonna spread it all over and cover the floor. Um, the particles can move about, but they are packed densely enough that the volume is maintained as the shape changes. So it, um, a liter of juice is going to be a liter of juice, whether I pour it into um, a bottle or on the floor. A gas is made of particles that are packed so loosely that it does not have a defined shape or a defined volume. And gases can be compressed. Um, if you have um, pressure on a space, it can compress it. So if you fill up a balloon, um, you can squeeze that balloon and compress the gas in that. Um, if you take that balloon to somewhere where it's very cold or somewhere warm, you might change the volume of that balloon, change the volume of the air inside of it. Matter is made of elements. An element is a substance that cannot be broken down to other substances by chemical reactions. Um, so it, it is the foundational building block of everything. A compound is a substance consisting of two or more elements in a fixed ratio. And compounds have characteristics that are different from its elements. So sodium chloride, sodium chloride is a compound. Here on the right, it is table salt, um, something that you probably eat a lot of every day. Sodium chloride is made of two elements, sodium and chloride. Sodium is, um, you know, you can see in this picture, it's kind of like a rock. Um, it's not something you're going to be eating. It's metallic. Um, and chlorine, it, chlorine is a gas that is very dangerous. It, um, you know, exposure to chlorine gas can kill people. Um, sodium chloride is not something that's going to be a gas that kills you. It's not a metallic rock. It's a delicious compound. So, um, turning 
individual elements into compounds gives you a completely new compound, completely new characteristics. Um, there are 92 naturally occurring elements. Um, if we look at a periodic table, there's probably going to be more than 92 elements on there because in the laboratory, we know how to create things. Even if only momentarily, we can throw things together and force them into creating new atoms. Um, but 92 elements are naturally occurring in, in um, nature. About 20 to 25% of them, so that's a fourth to a, um, a fifth of them, are essential to life. So they are essential elements. Um, the main elements of life are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So on this table, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, those are the four most abundant um, elements in the human body and in most living things. Um, those are, you should be able to tell me that, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, um, the most abundant um, components of life. Um, the, most of the remaining 4% are going to be calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, and magnesium. Some of these you can see are very tiny. Um, some things like um, iron or here on the bottom you can see trace elements. Less than 0.01% of mass. Boron, chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, iodine, iron, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, silicon, tin, vanadium, and zinc. These are still required for healthy life. If you don't have enough fluorine, um, you won't have very healthy teeth. If you don't have enough iodine, you might develop goiter. If you don't have uh, enough iron, you can get um, anemic. Um, but they're very, 0.01% of your mass. That's itty bitty. Those are tiny, tiny quantities. So those are called trace elements. They're required by your organism for a healthy life, but only in tiny quantities. Um, some elements are toxic. So just because something is naturally occurring does not mean that it is healthy for you. So arsenic is one element that can be toxic. Um, however, Natural selection has led to some species gaining adaptations to environments that have toxic elements. So some c plant communities have developed um, adaptations to be able to thrive in areas where there is serpentine. An element's properties are going to depend on the structure of its atoms. Um, each element has, is made of unique atoms. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. So if I had a pile of gold on the table, I don't, I wish it would, that would be kind of cool. But if I had a pile of gold, I could cut it in half and it would still be gold. I could put it into little tiny spoonfuls, it would still be gold. Um, I could give every, every one of you a little tiny pinch of it, it would still be gold. I could keep cutting that pile all the way down until we were down to individual atoms. Um, if we had the tools to do that, we could cut it all the way down to individual atoms. It would still be gold. But if we tried to cut it down anymore, it would not be gold anymore. The atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains the properties of that element. Atoms are composed of subatomic particles. So subatomic meaning below the atomic level. And the subatomic particles, we're going to talk about three of them. Neutrons, protons, and electrons. Neutrons have no electrical charge and they are found in the nucleus of an atom. The nucleus is a center part. In this picture it is these little brown balls. Protons have a positive charge. They are also found in the atomic nucleus. In this picture the little pink balls with little pluses on them. Electrons have a negative charge. Electrons are always moving around um, on the right side of the picture in part B, there are little, these little circles with the minuses. On the left side picture, um, to represent that they're just moving all around. You don't know where they are at any particular time. They're just any of that spot. Um, it's kind of shown as just a cloud of electrons can be in any of that area. Neutrons and protons in the atomic nucleus. And new electrons form a cloud around the nucleus. Um, 
neutron mass and proton mass are almost identical and we weigh them each in Daltons. So we say each neutron weighs about one Dalton and protons weigh about one Dalton. Protons are a tiny bit lighter, um, but we're gonna put their, them as about a Dalton. Electrons are so small that we don't count them when we're counting up their mass. So you can see how many Daltons an element weighs by seeing how many protons and neutrons are in its nucleus. And we just don't weigh electrons. It would be like if you weighed yourself, then you trimmed your nails and you went back expecting your weight to have changed. The weight of that trimming your nails doesn't affect your weight at all. Cutting your hair doesn't really affect your weight. Um, those electrons don't really affect the weight of an atom. It's like um, electrons in an atom are like the size of a house fly flying around a football stadium. So in this picture, they look fairly large, but in reality, it's about the ratio of a house fly if the entire football stadium was one atom. Atoms of the various elements will have different numbers of particles in it. Um, if you look at how many protons are in an atom, that tells you its atomic number. The number of protons or the atomic number determines what that element is is. So anything that has one proton in its atom is always hydrogen. If it has two protons in its atomic nucleus, it is always helium. If you change the number of protons in it, you change what that element is. The mass number is the sum of the protons and neutrons. Remember, electrons don't affect the weight here. The mass number is the sum of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. An atomic mass, which is the total mass of the atom, can be approximated by mass number. Um, there are technically some important differences between atomic mass and mass number, but for the purposes of this class, we are going to pretty much just assume those are the same. Mass number is typically expressing one atom, and atomic mass is usually an average of all of the atoms of that element, um, but we're going to use them as the same. Um, I am going to pause at this point and tell you there is a worksheet that I have on D2L um, to help you be comfortable figuring out um, what is the atomic number of this element, what is the mass number of this element? What is the atomic mass? You need to be comfortable calculating these numbers. If I give you an element and tell you this is how many protons or neutrons and electrons it has, you need to be able to figure out what's its atomic number, what's its atomic mass. Um, you need to be comfortable. There's some more calculations we're going to go through on that worksheet. Um, we will. That is a homework assignment you need to complete and bring to class for us to go over um, so if you have missed class when we we're talking about chapter two, make sure you do that homework assignment. Um, another thing that's important when we are talking about atoms is what kind of charge does that atom have? When protons and electrons are equal to each other, remember protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. When they're equal to each other, the atom is neutrally charged. So the pluses and the minuses balance each other out to give no overall charge. Um, when there are more protons, it's going to have a positive charge. When there are more electrons, it's going to have a negative charge. Um, so you should be able to look at a given element on the periodic table, given its atomic number and mass number, and be able to tell me how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in an atom of that element, um, assuming there is no charge. Or if you alter the charge, how would that alter the number of electrons? So we're not changing the number of protons, we're not changing the number of neutrons, we're going to say we've either added or subtracted electrons, and that's how you give it a charge. Um, sometimes you might alter the number of neutrons in, an, in a, an atom. Remember, the number of protons defines that element. So all atoms of that element always have the same number of protons by definition. But so we've talked about you can change your electrons and change a charge. Um, you can also change the number of neutrons. Changing the number of neutrons doesn't change the charge because they're neutral. Um, but 
it can affect how much that atom weighs. Um, every time you add a neutron on, you've just added another Dalton of weight. Or if you take a neutron away, you've taken away a Dalton of weight. Otherwise, those atoms are, are going to look exactly the same. Isotopes that have a different number of neutrons um, of the same type of element, I think I didn't say that right. Two atoms of the same type of element that have different number of neutrons are called isotopes. So they have the same number of protons, same number of electrons, same type of chemistry going on with them. Um, but by changing the neutrons, you've changed the weight. That makes it a different isotope. Um, some isotopes are stable and they're just going to hang on to those neutrons. Some isotopes don't like having that number of neutrons in it and they're going to start shoving out those extra neutrons. And those are radioactive isotopes. They're spontaneously going to get rid of those extra neutrons um, and it'll also release energy. The amount of time it takes an isotope to decay 50% is called its half-life. Um, different isotopes can have half-lives from a couple of seconds to billions of years. And so radioactive isotopes, um, because it gives off energy, they can be used as a way to release energy. But it also can be used as a way to measure the life of something by looking at what type of isotopes it has in it. You can figure out how long ago that, that um, sample was alive by seeing how its isotopes compare to the isotopes of living things today. Radioactive isotopes are often used as diagnostic tools in medicine. Um, radioactive tracers can be used to track atoms through metabolism, and they can also be used with sophisticated imaging tech instruments. Um, so you might be able to have images of your body, you know, if you go in for different medical treatments based on radioactive tracers. Okay, I'm going to pick up here on part two of this chapter, um, and I will see you all back in a little bit. Make sure you do that homework assignment, um, and that's when we'll come back and talk about energy and electrons. See you in a little bit. Bye.